Metal 4 has been removed, obviously, it's gone, that's what the mesh was. And you can see Metal 2, there's wires right here. And these, these wires are the, the feed or the return of, of the zone 1 area and the feed or the return of zone 2. I don't actually know which way the con all the conductors go. I know when I, on my area of edits that certain conductors are coming down in the edit so I can cut it below, I can cut it below and, and as long as I'm below the bridge I'm fine. You'll, you'll understand that shortly. Okay. So we really need to find the core in this chip. You saw what the mesh is like. Uh, in fact, one second, I skipped one thing. When we're looking at this, we, you, know, you see these edges like this. Something I didn't show you guys is that I, am, I had to make what's called a bridging map. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, let me hold off on this. I'm, I'm spoiling you. <laughs> um, so let, me go, let me go back. Let's go back to the cork. So we used those images that we had taken before. Okay, we use the, the, we strip off the mesh. We do, we do a real low res floor plan image just to give us an image of what are we looking at? What are we up against? And we do some identification of the areas. So like you saw the crypto engine, we saw the triple des, we saw the ROM, the EEPROM, and we knew, and we, we saw the core. The, that core was still, that, the actual core, the heart of the CPU where the instruction has to be in the clear. This runs, it's encrypted anywhere else. You're in, anywhere in this processor, you're looking at encrypted opcodes. Uh, 8051 based encrypted opcodes. Um, but this is the core, this is the actual like the central nervous system or the heart of the, of the chip. You, you know, if it's going to speak 8051, a, a long jump or an opcode 02 has to be an 02 in here. So this is the actual core, the heart, I tend to call it, of, the, uh, of a 66 processor. And you can see it, it actually runs on microcode, which is honestly, I think it's, uh, it's the most significant weakness of Infineon. Um, microcode tables, pretty much tell an attacker, you know, come, come to me because I have the instruction latches somewhere around this. Um, Thompson, Atmel, and NXP or Philips no longer use microcode today. Only Infineon's using microcode on this, and uh, it, it behooves me as to why I have no clue. So we need to get in here, and we need to, once we figure out where we need to be in this picture, and I'll give you a hint, it's up in here. Um, We've got to then go back to that, to the metal two. We, we're on down on metal two right now. So then we've got to go back to metal three and four, and we've got to see where were we in the, in the chip? Where were we in, what zone are we in? Uh, you know, hopefully where we want to go in isn't on the edge of a sector because that's really a pain in the butt. And, and then we need to make what's called, we need to make a bridge map because we need to make holes. If the chip knows that we've made holes in its mesh, it's going to shut down forever. So we need to basically figure out a way to bridge this chip in a way that, that all the lines over the area we want to dig down to are basically removed from the circuit, bypass them, jump them. And so we want to go here. This is basically the clear, the clear data bus. Um, you got actually, and the, the Infineon is really nice. They gave us the clock right here with a big, with a big test pad. This test pad makes me wonder, like, obviously they do testing, and they do testing without the mesh. There has to be a way to bypass that mesh, uh, you know, where you can run it like in loopback mode or something. Because um, the mesh is actually, you can feed registers with, um, with data and it goes through the mesh and comes back. I'm not sure, I don't understand, I don't have the manuals, to, so I don't know exactly what it does, but somehow they can tell if the value is right or not. And if it's wrong, they can then, the user can then take action. Which doesn't make sense because it, by the time the user takes action, I'm going to shut the chip down if I see an increase in power consumption or any type of hint that says they're doing an erase of some kind. So um, we've got a clock here. And then we've got D0, D1, D2, all the way down to D7. 8-bit, since that's what an 8051 is, 8-bit ALU. Anybody have questions so far? Okay. So, and, and this, this, anybody, nobody's wondering how did I know that this was the core? I mean, I've talked about it, but nobody, nobody? Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay, I know this is the core because this has been the same thing for 10 years now. Infineon, since they're old chips that you can touch with a probe station and a laser cutter, this has not changed ever. It just got more, more kabooblated, basically. They've added a lot more logic to it, memory addressing modes and things like this. But these bus lines still today do the same exact patterns that they did back in, in 1997, 98 on the, on the original 66Cs. So 
it's, you know, they, why make it, why fix it if it's not broke, I, I believe is the theory here. <laughs> so. so here's that same image, a little bit better quality of it though. Um, you can see here I identified the clock line in purple. So this purple line is the actual clock of the CPU. So no matter, in theory, if I, if I wanted to use three needles, let's pretend that I don't, I don't know how to, to keep it running on the outside world. Um, I, I, then I would need a third needle, and the third needle would be pl placed on this clock line. But when you're trying to probe the substrate, every needle, it, it's, it, each needle adds capacitance to the circuit and, and to the line. If that driver can't drive properly at, in, in, with a nice square edge at the frequency that it wants to run at, you know, it's, it's not going to run. It's going to shut right down. So this is the clock. And again, Infineon did something really nice on the clock. The clock is not symmetric in any way. Even if they're on the outside world, the clock will look to you like a, like a permanently high value. And the only time you'll see the clock go low, let's pretend that you have a 200 nanosecond waveform. You have a beautiful 200 nanosecond square wave going into this. They recondition your clock. They, they give kind of a PWM type of output, uh, pulse, pulse width modulation. So you get a, always a high, and then for maybe 20 nanoseconds, you get a low and then it's always high again. So the low is 20 nanoseconds, and then it's high for 180 nanoseconds. So they basically, they've given a clock period of time equal to your out, outside world, but it's, you'll, if you don't re know for sure that that's the clock signal, you won't, rec you won't recognize it. And I think that was a really good, um, I don't know exactly why their intent was, but it's, it's a really good point from a security perspective. So here's the data bus. Uh, it runs right through the memory. I even have it numbered right here. Uh, so you can see there's zero. It's kind of blurry now, but this is 100,000 100, uh, power optically magged. Um, so there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven's down here by itself. So on this, I basically want to pick where is the best spot to come into this chip and look. Now, if this was a 66P, I could have picked anywhere on this image because the P just simply had a solid plane of metal covering this, this area. This, the solid plane of metal covered this area and covered metal, uh, the MED. The MED is called the memory encryptor, encryptor and decryptor. Uh, so like I was explaining earlier, um, you know, everything is fetched encrypted and, and stored encrypted. They even have a dynamic key of eight bytes for EEPROM encryption, which the user can change. Um, except if you're on the bus, you'll see what the key is, unless the key was punched in through a pin, for that which ide would be ideal in most situations, but I've never seen it used. I've always seen the key calculated in some way, and once I know the key, I let it set it, and then the EEPROM would be decrypt, all the fetches will then be decrypted under that key. So because this is not a solid plane of metal above this chip, we need to kind of put the two images, we need to take metal three, image it, take metal two right here, image it, overlay the two images, and then use some techniques with Photoshop to see where do we want to go down, and uh, what, you know, if, if, is it in fact the best place to go? And so, we go into Photoshop, and uh, we have a chip. So where are we? Let's look. Here we are. So this, I, just in case, I know I'm going to play some switching tricks on you here. So, so this, mark this, this, this large piece of floating metal right here. This metal does nothing. It's, it's floating over a register. So here, there it is here. Everybody see that? Okay. So, and also you can see right here there was a via going down. And then here, there's another via, and the, and the it's, signals are, are um, they're shifting where they're, where they're laying. So now we'll go back to Photoshop, and here we see it again. Uh, here's the via, there's, there's the other via. This is actually uh, data bus bit one and data bus bit two, and here's our piece of metal. So now we zoom in, and what we see is we know that this is, this is zero, here's zero, and if we got lost, you could kind of correlate yourself by these vias because we know that they need, there's, it's an 8-bit data bus. There's eight registers right here holding an operand. This is the ALU area of the core. So this isn't actually execution of the instruction. This is, this is you know, maybe an add. So what are you adding? If you're, you know, I'm adding a five to the accumulator. So the, the five is gonna get latched in here. Um, with, uh, so these are basically, there's eight flip-flops sitting here. Um, we turn back on metal, metal, uh, metal, this is metal three. I'm